Great. So in the previous lecture, which unfortunately wasn't recorded, but I have uploaded the OneNote file for the previous lecture, lecture two on Carmen. So uh, in the previous lecture, we were discussing periodic signals in the continuous time uh, system. Uh, and then we talked about even and odd signals. We talked about exponential signals and uh, periodic complex exponential signals and harmonically related complex exponential signals. These were all in the continuous time domain. So now we will be talking about the same things, but in the discrete time. So today we are going to largely talk about discrete time signals. So let me remind you that the exponential signals in discrete time would be written in this fashion. Xn equals to C alpha raised to N or Xn equals to C e raised to beta n. Typically C would be a complex number. Alpha would be a complex number. And beta would be a complex number. So the simplest uh, exponential signal would be well, let me just write real signal. The, the simplest signal would be a real signal where C and let me say beta or alpha, they are all real numbers. Okay, so there's no complex numbers involved in the in this case. And so let me write some simple example. So this could be alpha raised to n. So I'm just going to assume c is equal to one for the time being. And in this case, this is growing exponential. If alpha is greater than one, and it's decaying exponential. If alpha is less than one. This is n, this is xn, this is the growing exponential signal. Let's draw the same thing for decaying exponential. This is decaying 
decaying exponential signal. We are just going through some nomenclature which we'll be using throughout this class. So these some of these things may seem quite elementary, but they are important for what's going to come in the future. OK, any questions so far on the growing exponential or decaying exponential signals? So these are all real valued signals. There is no complex numbers involved in this case. Okay, let's talk about uh, sinusoidal signals or periodic signals. So let's talk about periodic signals. The simplest periodic signal would be e raised to j omega naught n, which can be written as cos of omega naught n plus j sine of omega naught n. Here j equals to square root negative one. Okay, so if you just want to have cos of omega naught n, you can use two such exponential signals to construct cos of omega naught n. Okay, same thing with sine of omega naught n as well. So let's try to recall what was the definition of periodic signal. So the definition of periodic signal was there exists n a natural number such that x of n plus capital N is equal to x of n for all n. Okay, so let's see when uh, e raised to j omega naught n would be a, a, a periodic signal. So we would like e raised to j omega naught n plus capital N to be equal to e raised to j omega naught n for all n. This implies e raised to j omega naught capital N must be 2 pi m for some m. I'm sorry, on the notation you have there um, for the uh, n, right right after the def there, um, what, what is that backward notation? E? Yeah. Notation for all. No, the other one, uh, at the very beginning of that line. This one? Yes. Yeah, this is there exists. There exists. Okay, I, I'm going to really struggle remembering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be using these notations throughout the course. So this is there exists. This is belongs to. Um, this is for all. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So this should not be e raised to j omega naught and this should be j omega naught capital N. 
no omega not capital n no j this implies omega not must be 2 pi m over capital n so omega not should be uh, some rational number m over n multiplied by 2 pi then it's a periodic signal so periodic if omega not is a rational number multiplied by 2 pi Okay, so for other values of omega naught, it's not going to be a periodic signal, even though you might feel like if you plot the signal, you might feel, oh, it looks like a periodic signal, but in reality, it won't be a periodic signal. So let me give you an example. So Xn equals to cos n over six. Okay, I, I want to maybe, uh, you know, simultaneously talk about continuous time signal, x of t equals to cos t over six. So this is a periodic signal. However, this is not a periodic signal because one over six is not a rational number multiplied by two pi. So not periodic. because one over six is not equal to two pi m over capital N for any MN. Okay, so in continuous time, whatever value of omega naught you pick, it's going to be a periodic signal, but that doesn't happen in discrete time. In discrete time, omega naught must be a rational number multiplied by two pi. Only then it would be a periodic signal. If we don't know the values for M and capital N, how, how do we know that one that one six is not equal to the two pi M over N? So in, yeah, so that's a that's an excellent question. Uh, for this particular class, which is 3050, we will assume that you are given the periodicity of a signal. Now, in reality, uh, not, many of the signals you will encounter, uh, you know, so the way you get discrete time signals is through sensing a continuous time signal. So you will get a discrete time signal of, so you will sample the audio, uh, uh, the, the, the audio signal, which, is, which happens in continuous time, you're gonna sample it. Uh, so, so it will not be a, a periodic signal, but what you will do when you're doing signal processing, you know, in a company or perhaps taking a graduate level class, you're going to repeat the chunk of signal again and again. So you will pick like a five second signal and then you will repeat the same five second signal after like five to 10 seconds. And then you will repeat the same thing from 10 to 15 seconds and so on. And that's how you would construct a periodic signal out of a non-periodic signal. And then you will do what is known as Fourier transform and whatnot, which we will talk about in this class. So, so in reality, you will always repeat some chunk of the signal again and again in order to build a periodic signal. Uh, but in real world, you will actually not find a periodic signal that often. It, it just doesn't happen. Because of the way 
uh, things happen in real world where uh, things are continuous time, but you are sampling it at discrete time. So they may not match well enough for, for you to get a periodic signal. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so for instance, your heart beats like 72 times every minute. So in some sense it is periodic, but you know, let's say you walked up the stairs or you are, I don't know, uh, running or, or doing some sort of strenuous physical activity, then your heartbeat is going to go up or, uh, you know, change appropriately. So it no longer remains that, retains that periodicity as you would like to have for the math to work. But there are ways to get around it. Excellent question. Okay, I want to talk about one more example before we proceed to the next point. Let's say, what's wrong? Cos two, no, eight pi n over 31. We want to find what's the, so so if you look at the eight pi over 31, it looks like two pi m over n. It looks like in the form of two pi m over n. So let's try to find out what the periodicity of this particular signal is. Okay, so this signal is periodic. Let's try to find out the periodicity. So I want cos eight pi n plus capital N over 31 to be equal to cos eight pi n over 31 for all n in capital N. Okay, so I know that if cos of A equals to cos of B, then A minus B must be of the form of two pi M. So I'm using that identity here. And so what I get is N equals to, there will be some cancellations. So 31 M by eight, no 31 M by four. Okay, so, so we got to this point where I haven't specified M yet. I know that M is some natural number. I haven't specified what M is. So, and, and I know that capital N has to be a natural number, right? For us to ensure that it is a periodic signal. So what kind of value of M can we pick so that N becomes a natural number? So the question is, what M to pick so that N belongs to the set of natural numbers? What's the answer? Any multiple of four? Yeah, any multiple of four. So I'm gonna pick the smallest number four. Uh, but any multiple of four would work for sure. So I'm gonna pick M equals to four and that gives me capital N equals to 31. That would be the fundamental period for this particular periodic signal. Okay, any questions on this particular example? Could you quickly re-explain why we chose four again? Yeah. So remember the way I have defined 
period, there exists an n in n. So n has to be a natural number. And m is some natural number. m could be picked according to your choice, as long as you know that n has to be a natural number. So in this case, I, I got to this particular equation, this equation. And from here, I concluded this expression that n has to be 31 m over 4. Now, m is something that I can pick, but I can only pick those values of m for which capital N is a natural number. Okay, so I can only pick m such that n is a natural number. That's a requirement. And so I picked m equals to 4 because I am free to pick whatever m I want. I pick m equals to 4, and that way I get n equals to 31. And I know that 31 is a natural number, so it works. I could have picked m equals to 8 or I could pick m equals to 12, doesn't matter, um, because I'll get n uh, okay. to a natural number in all those cases. Okay, all right, so we have understood the periodicity. Let's talk about harmonically related You know, one thing I will tell you, uh, the application of whatever we are doing, signal processing and stuff, you see how I'm writing in my handwriting and this one note automatically recognizes what I'm writing and it, it basically types it out to name this particular sheet. This is all through this, some of this signal processing that we are studying in this class. Uh, we won't actually, you won't be actually able, be able to do it, but this is an application, a clear application of signal processing. Okay, harmonically related periodic signal. So the definition, just like in the case of continuous time uh, periodic signal was, this is all signals with period capital N. Okay. That was easy. So let's see what kind of omega. So the question then is what kind of omega zero yields signals of period capital N. So I want E raised to J omega naught N plus not omega naught. Uh, yeah, well, what kind of omega naught? Okay, it's fine. So let's, so omega naught is a free variable here. I want E raised to J omega naught N plus N to be equal to E raised to J omega naught N for all N in capital N this immediately implies omega naught capital N to be equal to two pi M. This implies omega naught has to be two pi M over capital N. for some integer z. So I know n in this case, I know n, m is something I can pick. Um, so I get like a sequence of omega naught which is indexed by M that, are, that all have periodicity N. So I can pick omega naught to be equal to zero, two pi over N 
4 pi over n 6 pi over n 8 pi over n and so on and so forth let me put minus 2 pi over n minus 4 pi over n So these are all the choices of omega naught you have. And if you pick these omega naught, all of them will have period capital N. And so therefore they are harmonically related periodic signals. Okay, any question so far? So when you pick omega naught equals to zero or two pi over n or four pi over n and all these uh, other values of omega naught, they all will lead to signals with period capital N. Okay. Now there is one peculiar property of discrete time periodic signal, which we are going to study next. So let's look at it. I'm going to define Xn as e raised to j omega naught n. Let me define Yn to be e raised to j omega naught plus two pi n. What do you think is the relationship between Xn and Yn? So I've increased, so as you can see, I've increased the frequency or at least it appears that I have increased the frequency. So certainly omega naught plus two pi is not equal to omega naught, it's strictly greater than omega naught. Okay, so I have, it, it seems like I've increased the frequency, but what do you think about the signal Xn and Yn? What, what are we going to get? You can either write in the chat box or you can just unmute yourself and, and say, what are your thoughts about the relationship between Xn and Yn? I, I could be wrong, but would they be harmonically related? Uh, yeah, but they are slightly more than harmonically related. Okay. They're the same? They are the same. Thank you. Okay, so let's, let's see. Actually, Xn equals to Yn. They are actually the same signal. So let's see why that is the case. So I wrote Xn equals to e raised to j omega naught plus, no, Yn equals to a j omega naught plus two pi n. I can write it as e raised to j omega naught n multiplied by e raised to j two pi n. So I see that e raised to j two pi n is actually equal to one. So the signal y n is actually equal to signal x n. Okay, so this is very interesting property for of a discrete time signal. And that's because n can only take discrete values. So therefore this situation arises n can only take actually not just discrete values, it can only take the value of integers. So this sort of peculiar case arises in the discrete time signal domain. And, and so we see that there are a lot of frequencies which will actually give you the same signal because of this reason. 
So if I plot this signal space omega or omega zero, well, let me just plot omega. So I have, let's say this is zero. This is my omega naught, omega naught plus two pi, omega naught minus two pi omega naught plus four pi, these are all frequencies at which you are going to get the same signal. There's no difference whatsoever. So what typically we do is when we talk about frequency of a discrete time signal, we will restrict ourselves to the set zero to two pi or minus pi to pi, okay? Because of this property. So I can just pick any interval. Let me just pick one such interval, which is zero to say two pi and I'm going to just pick a frequency which is only within this interval when I'm talking about frequency for a discrete time signal. So typically frequency of discrete time signal is restricted to be this is the principal zone right yeah yeah zero to two pi or minus pi to pi so this is closed interval zero and open interval two pi like uh, on the two pi side it's open so two pi is not included in this set and the same thing here, minus pi is included in the set, but pi is not included in the set. Because minus pi, the signal coming out of minus pi will be the same as the signal coming out of frequency pi. Okay, any questions so far? So why is um, the negative pi got a square bracket and the positive pi a curved one? Yeah. Are so, we not including positive pi? Yeah, we are not including positive pi in the interval. Why not? Uh, because the positive pi, the frequency, so the signal coming out of positive pi will be the same as the signal coming out of negative pi. So if oh, you put okay. positive pi, then it will be a redundant information. Okay, right. thank you. Yeah. They're all two pi apart. The same thing happens here. Two pi is not included in this set. Okay. Now, what else have we not talked about? Okay, fundamental frequency. So we didn't talk about fundamental frequency. Let me start a new page. Okay, so if the fundamental period is N, which is the minimum period, capital N. So you could have, um, so the periodicity could be, uh, you know, there is a whole bunch of capital N for which the signal will be periodic. So you will pick the minimum of those capital N that will define the fundamental period. Let me denote it by capital N zero. So we have two pi m over capital N equals to omega naught. 
So the fundamental frequency, which is defined as two pi n naught, let's say two pi n naught, it's equal to omega naught over m. So this is the fundamental frequency. and which is given by omega naught over m. It's the same thing. So two pi over n naught is what is called the fundamental frequency of a periodic signal. And in this case, it is equal to omega naught over m. This, is, this, this particular part is the same as continuous time signal. So there's no difference there. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Now we will talk about very special classes of discrete time signals and the continuous time signals. So I guess I won't get to the continuous time part in today's class, but maybe I will. Uh, we'll talk about unit impulse and unit step functions. If you're going to make a career in signal processing or control systems, um, the rest of your life, you will just be hearing about unit impulse and unit step functions. Okay, so 35th, uh, sorry, 3551, 3050, 3551, um, and the subsequent controls classes, you will always be talking about unit impulse and unit step functions because they are extremely important class of signals. So let's consider the discrete time. So the discrete time part is easier to understand. So let's just talk about the discrete time signal. This is denoted by delta n. So delta n is like the standard notation for impulse function. One for n equals to zero and zero for n which is not equal to zero. This is the impulse function. Zero everywhere, and it takes a value of one at the uh, at when n is equal to zero. The step function Okay, so what do you think is the relationship between the step function and unit impulse? Maybe it's, it's, maybe it's difficult, but I just want to 
ask this question before I proceed forward to talking about what's the relationship between impulse and step function is. Can someone can someone tell me what the relationship is? Uh, they're in resources. Yeah. Yeah. They are. So step function is an integral of the impulse function. So you can write. I'm sorry, could you say that again? So the step function is an integral of the impulse function. So let's see. Integral. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see how, how to write it because this is a discrete time signal. So the integral has to be written just as a summation. Okay, so this is integral of impulse function. You add all the impulse functions so far and you get the step function. Okay, that's the relationship. So when you turn on the switch at your home, you are giving an impulse input and the switch actually converts an impulse input to a step input. So it's an integrator, the switch at your house, like the switch to turn on your fan or the switch to turn on the lights, they are all um, integrators. They take an impulse input and they output a step function. On the other hand, when you are pressing the doorbell, then it's just an impulse input. For a very brief moment, you press the button and then after that you just stop. So that's an impulse input. So those are the uh, real world, you know, day-to-day -day activities where we use the impulse input and a step input. So one property of the impulse function is called the sampling property of the impulse function. So let's say you have a signal Xn, you multiply it by Delta N, what do you get? Well, you get X zero when N is equal to zero and you get zero for all N not equal to zero. Right, because delta n is equal to zero for n not equal to zero, so you multiply it by signal, you get it, uh, you get the number equal to zero. And so this can be equivalently written as x zero multiplied by delta n. So this is the sampling property of impulse function. More generally, x n delta n minus n zero is equal to x n zero delta n minus n zero. So we are going to touch upon this topic again in uh, many subsequent lectures. And we'll invoke this sampling property of the impulse function at many places throughout the course. Okay, so you multiply a signal with an impulse function. You get a sample of that signal at N zero multiplied by the same impulse function.
ओके एनी एनी क्वेश्चन सो फार आई थिंक दिस इज प्रिटी स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड लेट्स टॉक अबाउट द सेम थिंग बट इन कंटिन्यूअस टाइम so in continuous time maybe i can introduce the step function first which is 1 if t is greater than equal to 0 and 0 when t is less than 0 and so the step function looks like this that's why it's called a step function this is t equals to 0 and at t equals to 0 the function jumps directly to 1 this is 1 let me write this is ut this is time okay now remember i had mentioned that the impulse function is well the step function is an integration of the impulse function so by that logic an impulse function would be a derivative of the step function so i am going to write delta t as dut over dt okay now i'm taking the derivative so what does that imply so the simple thing is well before time t equals to 0 and after time t equals to 0 the function ut doesn't change so i have 0 for t not equal to 0 because the function ut doesn't change its value at t greater than 0 or t less than 0 now what happens at t equals to 0 is it infinite yeah it will be infinite okay but it's not any infinite it's the infinite so that the integral of delta t is going to be equal to a step function okay now all of you are going to uh say this is blasphemy how can you have a function that takes infinite value at just one point and zero everywhere else so let me try to reason out with you that this is a reasonable approximation of a very special class of functions okay so this is my time and let's say i'm picking a ut which is not a step function but an approximation of the step function and is actually a differentiable function look something like this it's an approximation to a step function but it's differentiable everywhere and i take the derivative of this particular function and i'm going to get something like this is the derivative of this particular approximate step function so let me call it ukt and let me call it delta kt k is the index okay and i'm going to let k go to infinity the property of this delta kt is that the area under this curve this area is actually equal to 1 okay but the support of the function this is 1 over k okay so i have constructing a function where the support is very small so as k goes to infinity the support will become almost negligible 
and the, but the area under the curve has to be equal to one so which means that this point must this point must escape to infinity so that the area under the curve always remains equal to one so delta t is actually a limit of delta kt as k goes to infinity where the area under the curve for each of this delta kt is actually equal to 1 but the support is actually vanishingly small as k goes to infinity uh, what are you saying there the uh, support the support is where the function takes positive value Okay, so the function is zero. The function is zero in this region. The function is zero in this region. And it only takes positive values in a very small region, which is of the size of one over K. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so this delta t that you are seeing here, it's actually an approximation of such a function. And so when you assume that your delta t is defined in this fashion, a lot of your computation becomes much, much simpler, right? And you can write a lot of beautiful equations using this delta t. And what is phenomenal about this whole mathematical jugglery is that the response you get from an actual system based on this mathematical uh, approximation turns out to be in, in remarkable. So the reality is in remarkable, remarkable agreement with the theoretical prediction. And therefore it becomes a very, very useful tool for doing design and analysis of control systems as well as other forms of signal processing based methods. Okay. Now this also has that sampling property of unit impulse. So you have XT Delta T, this is equal to X zero times infinity for T equals to zero. And you can again write it as X zero delta T. Notice that I have written X zero times infinity and not just infinity. So this X zero is signifying what's the area under the curve and so for delta t, the area under the curve is equal to one. And so I need to make sure that it is multiplied by x zero so that the area is adjusted for the curve. Okay. And we have the same property. If I do delta t minus t naught, I have x of t naught delta t minus t naught. As I mentioned previously, we are going to revisit this equation again in chapter two and chapter seven of the book. Uh, when we get to it.
Okay, so uh, I'm going to stop the recording. If there are any questions, feel free to uh, stay back and then we can have some uh, minor discussions if, if you have any questions. Otherwise, feel free to drop off. And thank you. Have a great uh, long weekend and we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.